two cautionary notes really when when I start a little bit of the presentation or I at least try to get into the meat of the the uh, questions that are out there uh, number one is I can't predict how long how deep uh, what the effects are going to be of, of this uh, COVID-19. Uh, you know, I listen to the news as you all do, and they, there's a V-shape idea out there that's quick and up back up again. There's the U-shape. Uh, there's talk of recession. There's talk of depression. I do not know. And so I'm just trying to put together an illustration maybe later on in the presentation that uh, contemplates some level of deterioration as it relates to receipts. The second thing I want to say as a cautionary note is the relief and stimulus that's coming out from the federal government, uh, there's a massive amount of it coming up, coming out. I'm trying to read as much as I can, as quick as I can. I noticed today Senator Groney sent out uh, a fairly detailed uh, email as it relates to educational relief. And of course, we don't know exactly how to interpret it or how it's going to work in, in the relief side of things. Uh, another primary example is state and local. I'm still trying to get a grasp on what that legislation has. We're supposed to get a billion, $250 million. Uh, however, there's an exclusion as to uh, relief as it relates to revenue reduction. So hopefully Monday, there's supposed to be some new regs coming out. So this is really kind of a, uh, a fluid situation. It'll be uh, subject to a lot of interpretation, and obviously it's a moving target for us. But let's uh, just talk about the fact, first of all, that we do have a budget, that we have modified that budget with LB 1198, and that was to provide emergency funds for the COVID-19 uh, relief. That was $83.6 million. We took it out of the rainy day fund. Now, if, if we talk about the rainy day fund, maybe <clears throat> you need to probably put a pencil to this uh, because the rainy day fund will change. Um, originally, we came to the floor with $731 million in the rainy day fund, pretty much restored it back to where we started several years ago. Uh, $83 million taken out of it drops it down to $647 million. Uh, under this relief package, I'm expecting that 83, which is direct cost of the COVID uh, virus, to be fully reimbursed. Um, the reason that I'm saying that fully reimbursed is that under that regulation, it says direct cost associated with the COVID. Now, Jerry Oligmuller, as I, I indicated on the floor when I was talking, has set up an accounting system to track the federal receipts coming in as well by agency. So it's kind of a sub subset of accounting uh, that will track the dollars coming in and the dollars going out associated with COVID. So we'll have a good accountability, good transparency relative to this. Now where it's just subject to whatever uh, this regular, what the regulations will be. And my guess is there's gonna be a lot of pushback from a lot of states saying, hey, the real effect is a revenue shortfall as it relates to COVID. So don't have that interpretation yet. Certainly uh, it's a fluid situation. But as you move forward, because we've moved the filing date, uh, uh, revenue projected $385 million impact on the uh, filing uh, amounts uh, that we normally would receive in our state on April 15th. That was the projected. As you move those to July, it's a revenue neutral situation for uh, the state as it relates to the biennium budget. However, that 275 million that we talked about going into the rainy day fund will not go into the rainy day fund because of the, the, uh, the projection was that we were going to have excess receipts. Obviously, 385 subtracted from that takes away from the excess receipts plus any deterioration in revenue relative to sales tax and income tax uh, between uh, April 1st as well uh, through, uh, through uh, June 30th uh, will be an, an additional deduct. So revenue neutral as it relates to, to the, the biennium budget, not revenue neutral. It brings the, with the reimbursement of the 83 uh, six, 
that would bring our rainy day fund going into the next part of the biennium at 455 million. So that's what we're gonna have to work with the 455. Now, one of the things that I've said, yeah, we do have a budget. We don't necessarily have to come back and adjust it, but I will tell you this, that if we don't come back to adjust it, there's about $62 million of what I call non-discretionary items. Most of that is the flood related items of about $55.2 million of flood, but it also impacts things like uh, HHS. They have a problem with the uh, Lincoln Regional Center that has to be repaired. Certainly a homestead exemption and a reimbur reimbursement of counties. Those would be things that really we need to get past and get, get through so that they have some certainty relative to those items. Um, obviously, we came to the floor with a budget that, that does not represent where we're at today. We had a 3% increase in spending. Uh, appropriations actually had approximately $30 million of discretionary. And in this situation, those discretionaries would go away. But if we don't readjust the budget, if we don't readjust what the revenue per, uh, forecast is, going into next year, then we'll have that situation where we'll have a two budget year where we're adjusting the current year and uh, then going into the next biennium trying to do a, a budget for the next biennium. So I'd like to avoid that as all possible, but I can't predict the future either. So if we don't go back, we do have a budget. It just puts a heck of a load on us as as we go into the the next by uh next year the next biennium the next session um if we go into the next session obviously revenue forecast will be a big part of that and march actually is not out officially but i can tell you it was a fairly strong month and it didn't represent what i think will happen because there's about a 30-day lag in sales tax um, certainly with the layoffs and some of the things we saw on unemployment uh, there's going to be tax receipts shortfalls as, as it relates to estimated and payroll tax. So that's going to show up predominantly in, of course, the 385. In April, we generally get IH, uh, IHS and Moody forecast updates every month based on our month. So it comes in about the 10th. So the April would come in May 10th. I'm hoping that if we can hold off till June, then we'll have the May also. At that particular point in time, we have two choices as far as forecasts. We can make it up, well, three choices. One of them, we make it up ourselves, which is not very authoritative. But then we can also uh, have some kind of projection put together by both revenue as well as uh, fiscal and do a, a recasting of where they think the revenue is at. Or we could uh, petition, and there is a, a way of petitioning the forecasting board to get back together and give us kind of a preliminary forecast on what they're thinking. Again, just two months of results, no idea where we're going futuristically. What I did put together was, and asked fiscal to put together, and they did, um, about a 10% reduction in revenue relative to annual revenue, which is about $500 million hit. And based on that hit, um, and taking out the non-discretionary or the discretionary items out of the budget, all of the excess of 133 million that we brought uh, goes away. Uh, as you start to crank through that whole thing, there's about a $53 million shortfall uh, that has to be taken care of. Now, remember, if it's 455, 53, you can move down probably the 55 million of, uh, of flood to the rainy day fund, depleting the rainy day fund fund to about four, 402 and take care of that shortfall. So with that 10%, um, and actually it was prepared with 20% for the six months uh, that we think are affected, uh, we can probably put something together that even though we don't have any A bills, even though we don't have any room for any other incentives. And again, going just reflecting back on the budget that we had, we had 133 million that we brought to the floor as excess over the cash reserve position. With that 133, we were going to try to address uh, a, certain A bills that sat on certainly final as well as select. 
but we also were trying to uh, put together a fairly large package for uh, property tax relief. 720 was in that, the military was in that. Uh, based on a 10% reduction, I think those things have to be uh, shoved aside. And, uh, you know, it just depends on how long and how deep I, uh, and, and how much the government reimburses us uh, for those types of hits. So with that, I, I just uh, want to say also the thing that we're trying to get our grip, uh, our hands around is the increase in cost. We know there's more people on unemployment, so we expect utilization rate to go up in Medicaid. That would be one example. Game and parks are going to take a hit for taking uh, and, uh, and closing uh, the campgrounds. That would be another example of some of the things. And you can kind of work through each agency. Each agency will have some kind of deterioration due to COVID-19. So um, there will be increase in cost. There will be other adjustments that we'll have to make that we need to be cognizant of. Um, obviously, we're not going to know those things going into the next session. We'll have a better idea. We'll have a forecast uh, in November that I think will reflect more uh, accurately uh, what has happened to our state. Most of the things that I'm looking at and listening to right now from an economic standpoint, they're talking three years. That makes the most sense to me. So by looking out and planning, I think this is going to have an effect over a three-year period of time. How deep and how strong effect uh, to get back to what we call normal, and we don't even know what normal looks like right now. Those are the things that we're going to have to to react to. So with that, I, I can take some questions. I know that I threw some numbers out at you. Um, I think we're in okay shape to take some of this, but it's not going to be, uh, you know, we're going to go back to, again, no fiscal notes, no nothing passes that, that has a fiscal impact. Thank you, Senator Sinner. That was great. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, one question that I know that a lot of people have been asking themselves is that the emergency funding that you did pass um, allocated that $83.6 million to address immediate needs such as public health and to UNMC. Have you gotten additional requests or do you foresee us enacting another bill to address COVID uh, relief immediately or do we need to wait and see what the end results are on the state of Nebraska before we spend any more money? Well, um, based on what I'm hearing today and I talked to uh, Matt Miltenberger this morning, and they're, they're going to spend as much as they can before they get this, this uh, stimulus money in. And they believe that the 83.6 will be fully reimbursed by the uh, relief package sent to us. And that's that uh, $1 billion, uh, $250 million that we're going to get. They, they feel fairly strongly that this is directly related. And again, we have an excess cushion of about 25 million. So I do not hear anything from them saying that they've spent all the money or that they're gonna need any more. But I, the good news is it looks like it will be reimbursed through this uh, relief package. And you, you talked about how there's gonna be increased costs to the state and that's, that's expected. We have more people filing for unemployment, probably people enrolling in SNAP and Medicaid. Do you have any idea what impact that is like if we see a five percent increase in nebraska's unemployment what that relatively is going to cost us no i have not seen any kind of analysis there but uh you know there is a fear out there that 385 the people who owe taxes today that are business owners especially who have closed are they going to be able to, to pay their taxes that were due that's that's one of the questions uh, um, that's out there right now and i don't know what that hit looks like so that 385 may end up being some other number, 350, 340, uh, which will be a direct re in direct relationship to the uh, COVID-19. So I, I do not have that relationship between unemployment and the hit that in revenue. Um, one other question. Now we, we delayed the tax filing deadline. So that way now people can, can file uh, by July 15th, and then they can pay their taxes then to give them a little bit of a buffer. What impact do you see if we have businesses that maybe couldn't make the April deadline, but they can make the July deadline? And does that, that pushes money into the next fiscal year? Can you talk a little bit about that impact and what's going to have on your committee? 
Well, obviously the impact directly is on the rainy day fund, which I talked about that 275 million is predominantly gone. You know, drop the rainy day fund down uh, from where it was at, where we projected to be 731 million, it will drop down to 455 million. That's the first impact. The second impact is, is there going to be a shortfall of the 385 from businesses that have gone out of business that can't take pay their taxes? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think anybody does. Um, the next uh, calculation that you have to do is as you move forward in this taxable year that has to ultimately be paid in April 15th of next year, what is that shortfall look like, and what do the refunds look like? Because you got corporate, um, you know, you can go back uh, uh, and collect taxes from uh, carrybacks. Uh, certainly that will be something that somebody needs to get a grip on. And I presume that revenue will be doing projections. So we could see as we move into the next biennium, a, a fairly substantial hole in revenue due just to refund. Thank you. And um, I did receive a question from someone listening. Uh, they said, what interactions or conversations has the legislature had with our federal delegation regarding future stimulus package programs to support the state budget? Yeah, I can't speak for anybody else, but I've, I've got a call in to Ben Sass as well as, um, and I've, I have talked to Adrian Smith's folks, just trying to get an interpretation and a feel for what's happening on this, uh, the state and local tax uh, relief bill. And obviously we'd like to, them to broaden the language to include revenue shortfalls. Um, so far, uh, you know, based on what they know, and Monday will be a, a day where the regulations actually come out. So I'm hoping they have a broader interpretation, but I can't speak for the rest of the legislature, but I, I, would, I would imagine that everybody right now is, is trying to communicate as best I can, but still standing back and listening and trying to read what's coming out. So I know uh, NCSL has been on top of set, uh, several pieces of legislation. So I think a lot of us are taking some, some of the things that are coming out and comparing it with uh, the analysis by, by uh, NCSL. Thank you. And, and we've talked a little bit about the CARES Act, uh, that, that piece of legislation that Congress passed to send money to the states to help with COVID-19. So Nebraska is going to receive $1.25 billion. Um, and in the CARES Act, local governments or populations with half a million or more are eligible for aid. So based on my rough calculations, it looks like Douglas County is our only county with over 500,000 people. And so they're going to receive around 166 million, and that'll leave the state with like 1.08 billion. Um, some people have been asking questions about the the losses to other local governments, schools, the university system, and other political subdivisions. Do you have any idea or thoughts about how the state might monitor these losses, or how these federal funds might flow directly to the local governments instead of going to the state budget? And I know that's a really detailed question, but maybe just kind of give us an overview yeah. since we don't know the details yet. Various aspects, obviously the, the Education Relief Act came out or the Education Relief Fund and, and uh, related secondary elementary and, and higher ed came out. And I spoke a little bit to that and it's early, it's early in the game to see how those proceeds, there's about I believe 66 million, and I could be wrong on that, but to be dispersed between those three different entities. I don't know if that's a grant program or a direct uh, apply to the state, but the state administers that. Um, on the local side of things, Douglas County, if they're over 500 million, my interpretation was that they could opt to, to, uh, to apply directly to the treasury for reimbursement, and that would be a deduct now, how they do that, I, I guess I don't know, but there are other proceeds that are supposed to go to local governments that apply. Um, and uh, my understanding is it's about a 45% number to be reimbursed. Again, it's early in the game. Monday, it's gonna give me a better interpretation, but I think the state's expecting a, a fairly large chunk of that to stay at the state level. But we will, I know that uh, the governor and, uh, and that administration 
have oversight over that money. So as far as the legislature is concerned, I'm still trying to get an interpretation on this is what is our oversight uh, responsibilities and and uh, because everything seems to 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 be non-discretionary. In other words, the reimbursement that we got at HHS, for an example, for uh, for Medicaid. Um, in looking at the bill, it looked like maybe there's some discretionary money. It, as the interpretation came out, it is very 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 detailed and it's very non. Uh, discretionary. So it's helpful, but maybe not for the increase in utilization. So those would be areas that we're, I mean, we're just trying to get a feel for. The money actually from the relief programs are coming to the administrative side. So the legislature will have some say, I believe, over the long term, but short term, like I said, there's a good accounting system to account for the dollars coming in uh, and certainly the dis disbursements going out. That accounting system that you talked about, is that open to the public so the people here on this webinar and, and other people can look at that money and see where it's going? You know, I would think um, the accounting system is embedded in, in, for an example, if you have an agency like HHS, there are line items for money coming in and line items for money going out. So it's a detailed accounting system that, that contemplates all the agencies and all the functions, budgetary functions of each agency. And I think there's 278 budget programs. So my guess is uh, Jerry pretty much has a uh, debit credit type of accounting system uh, to account for the funds and to be transparent. Now, can he pull all of that together? Uh, I think he can do a summary of it uh, and pull it back to that. But uh, as far as providing it for the, the folks today, I, I, it's way way too early in the game for that. Okay, thank you for that. And then um, because we are expecting increased money to our budget, I know that last biennium, there were some new spending plans because the state had been kind of tight. And so do you foresee any of those plans that were passed last year in the budget, us having to make additional cuts to the budget, not just new funding, but existing funding so that we can fill our budget hole? Additional funding you're you're asking me about? I, I don't so know. So like last so last year, if there was an increase in spending in a specific area, would we need to do additional budget cuts instead of just saying no new spending? Do we need to cut other things in our budget? Well, if we go much beyond five hundred million, we'll probably probably end up looking at areas where we'll have to cut back the increases that we have contemplated. Right now, it looks like it, even at five hundred. Uh, million dollar shortfall would be at a two two percent to two and a half percent increase in expenditures. So you're still cutting back on the trajectory of expenses, but not necessarily cutting back on uh, what we would call base. But again, that's <laughs> you know we'll see we'll see how this all works. Now the one thing about forecasts, I will tell everybody when you're going down, forecasts tend to be more optimistic when you're going up they tend to be more pessimistic so um, what we get I think in June will be modified down in November February and of course then we get a final forecast in April so and talking about those delayed forecasts and how long it's going to take for us to get this let's say and I don't know I'm just uh, speculating here let's say the quarantine goes until June and we have the in it and it pushes it back. Do you foresee the legislature needing a special session to come back and address this if it does drag out through the summer? No, that's above my pay grade. You'd have to ask the governor and the speaker. Okay, thanks. Uh, Senator Stinner, was there anything else you wanted to just mention? Um, I'm happy to take comments from the audience. If you all don't mind putting your questions in the chat, then I will ask Senator Stinner and he can answer your individual personal questions. You know, I just stay safe. That's just kind of the watchword right now. The better we do this, this uh, distancing and, and uh, social distancing and, and self-quarantine and the like of that, the faster we can get out of this. Sarah, this is Adam Weinberg. Uh, while we're waiting for some folks to come in with some questions, I did have some questions that were emailed to me at the beginning of the program. 
Uh, Senator, one of our viewers was asking, how will appropriations for the university and colleges be impacted in this crisis particularly? You know, we've had, I've had a discussion. Um, certainly it's a heads up situation and we'll see what the relief package is for them. Uh, right now, uh, what I'm basically telling them is we're going to be pretty flat in terms of what we're able to do um, appropriations wise for the states and the universities. But if you're if you're a business person that's running those institutions, I think that you have to look at 10% reductions uh, as a strategy, and then a plan B or C uh, that really takes you down 20, 25%. So those are scenarios that they need to run to see just exactly how they're going to have to react to not only revenue decreases from or uh, appropriations but revenue decreases from attendance or lack of attendance. So, uh, and any other additional costs, you know, with the university had and the state schools let people go early. So it puts a burden on the reduction of uh, uh, certainly for, for a room and board type of thing. So we'll see how this all works out. But interestingly, the University of Nebraska compared to other Big Ten schools, and this came from President Carter, most of their kids come from from Nebraska, so they probably won't take a hit as far as the number the numbers coming in as much as say a Michigan or Michigan State that relies on international and out of state students. So we'll see how this all plays out, but there's different scenarios and different levels that you have to plan for. And again, if if we're able to use it, uh, these these Fed relief funds. Uh, for revenue shortfall, you know, we can kind of get through this. Sarah, you had a, thank you, Senator. You had a viewer question that came in. I did. Uh, someone said, if we can't use the money from the federal government for the revenue shortfall, do you foresee us having to raise taxes next year to fill our budget gap? Well, I'm going to say this, no new taxes. That's been the mantra of the governor, and I tend to agree with that actually raising taxes in the, in the middle of kind of a recessionary environment that we're talking about is really contrary to to what we should be doing. Um, I know that sounds a little bit strange when you have a revenue shortfall, but economically you can't burden people with additional taxes when they're just trying to survive. And I that just got well. another, oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. Oh, no, I just got another question um, following up on that. And you had mentioned this earlier in your opening about how you don't see that we have the money for property tax relief. And so the question is, if the local governments are hurting across the state, where do you foresee the property tax problem or issue going in the state? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that we get some uh, Monday an interpretation on what we can do at the local side to help them as best we can. And um, I'm just looking at Scott's Bluff and they're they're relying on sales tax and that's obviously going to be down. Uh, so they're going to need some help either at state level and or uh, through this relief package. I'm hoping it comes through the relief package. Um, uh, it just This whole thing just ripples straight down through state government, well, federal government through the state government. And I guess we're all going to have to to sit back and start to react and, and plan for, for revenue shortfalls, for essential services, those types of things that, uh, that we normally go through in business when we have a down cycle, so. Well, folks, I just wanna remind you as we continue through the program, we've still got some time here together and you're welcome uh, to ask your questions in the chat window and we'll deliver them to Senator Stinner here. Uh, on that topic of, of the taxpayer, uh, we got a report, of course, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis this week that showed that after the fact, when it was all said and done for 2019, Nebraska was actually the lowest ranking state for economic growth. I think some of that can certainly be attributed to the flood that we faced and the blizzards that we faced as a state. A lot of people in agriculture are, are wondering what the legislature is going to do for them as it relates to property taxes. Um, and people are going to have to pay their property taxes regardless of, of this economic climate. Do you have any thoughts for your constituents and other Nebraskans who are who are wondering what's going to happen in the coming months? You know, I uh, right now I would have to say that anything that we could do on property tax would be minimal. 
um, certainly with the resources we have, what we can move around, what we could cut uh, would be a function of that, but I don't see any big robust $520 million package. Uh, is there something else that we can do? And I guess that would have, that would be uh, something that we could talk about once we get back in session and, and uh, see just where we're at. But I'm, I'm not real hopeful, guys. Well, Senator Stinner, we we will uh, we really appreciate you making time to join us on today's webinar. This is our first webinar. We hope not our last, but I think it was really excellent for you to join us, folks. Uh, we're going to invite Senator Stinner to offer any parting thoughts that he has for you. If you do have any questions, of course, we'd be happy to get those by email and 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 respond to things as we go. Uh, but uh, Senator, why don't you perhaps give a few uh, parting thoughts as as we conclude today's program, and uh, we'll leave it to you. Yeah, uh, really parting thoughts would be, you know, this stimulus package or relief package at the state and local at a billion two fifty. If we're able to use it for revenue shortfalls and if we're able to push down some of these dollars uh, effectively to, to the local governments, uh, and if this is not a deep, dark uh, depression, recession, uh, we might be able to skate through this uh, reasonably in reasonably good shape but that's not what i'm planning for i think it's going to be a, a a situation where yeah we're going to have a revenue shortfall but it carries over for a two three year period of time um, there is a wave that goes through that uh, process of uh, receipts and disbursements so but i want everybody to try try to stay optimistic you know, you plan for the worst and, and hope for the best. And that's kind of where I'm at today. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Senator Stinner. I really, really appreciate it. Um, again, thank you everyone for attending today. I hope what Senator Stinner said was informative and helpful on how this crisis is affecting us here home in Nebraska. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to Platt Institute and we will do the best that we can to get you answers to your questions. Uh, thank you again. And I hope everybody has a very safe and productive uh, day. Thank you.